Hi, welcome to the Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class, sponsored by the Hurricane Utah North Stake of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm Mike Parker, and since 2008, it's been my privilege to be the instructor for this class. The Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class meets on Thursday evenings between September and May to discuss the scriptures, teachings, and history of the restored Church of Jesus Christ. If you live in or are visiting the Hurricane St. George area, I'd love to have you join us. Time and location are available on the class website. There's a link to that in the show notes just below this video. Also on the class website, you can download my notes, which includes footnotes documenting my sources, this PowerPoint presentation, and handouts that I distribute in class. Please note that this YouTube channel and the class website are not official sites of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Hurricane Utah North Stake, or any other church unit or department. I alone am responsible for the content on these sites. What you're about to see is a recording of my notes for one of the lessons. If you enjoy this video, please click the like button and share it with a friend. And please feel free to subscribe if you'd like to be notified when new content is posted to this channel. My friends, the gospel of Jesus Christ is true. Joseph Smith was a prophet of God, and the authority and keys that he held are now vested in the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And most importantly, Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. I hope you enjoy this lesson. The revelations in this week's lesson mostly concern the founding of the Restored Church of Christ, its organization, and the doctrines pertaining to its establishment. We'll be discussing Doctrine and Covenants sections 20 through 24 and 26. How early did Joseph Smith know that he would organize Christ's church as part of his divine calling? Probably as early as his first vision. Recall that he went into the grove in 1820, wanting to know which of all the religious sects was right, that he might know which to join. He was told that, quote, all religious denominations were believing in incorrect doctrines, and that none of them was acknowledged of God as his church and kingdom and I was expressly commanded to go not after them, at the same time receiving a promise that the fullness of the gospel should at some future time be made known unto me." Unquote. The revelations Joseph received during the translation of the Book of Mormon in 1829 mentioned the rising up and the coming forth of my church out of the wilderness. They declare, I will establish my church and counsel Wait a little longer until you shall have my word, my rock, my church, and my gospel. In late 1829, Joseph and his associates began preparations to organize the church. What is now Doctrine and Covenants section 20 is called the Articles and Covenants of the Church of Christ. When was section 20 written? At the first conference of the church held in Fayette, New York, on the 9th of June, 1830. The document that is now section 20 was read aloud by Joseph Smith Jr. and received by unanimous voice of the whole congregation. This makes it the first revelation in this dispensation to be formally presented to and sustained by the body of the church. The Articles and Covenants was probably written sometime after the church was organized on 6th of April, 1830. However, the ideas in it go back to at least June 1829. The Church History Department has an early draft of this document in Oliver Cowdery's handwriting. The three-page manuscript begins with, quote, a commandment from God unto Oliver, how he should build up his church and the manner thereof, unquote. And it concludes with, quote, written in the year of our Lord and Savior, 1829, a true copy of the Articles of the Church of Christ, etc." Unquote. Most of the document consists of quotations taken from the Book of Mormon and the Prophet Joseph's early revelations. 
Many of the quoted Book of Mormon passages were retained in the Articles and Covenants of the Church, which is now section 20. The origin of section 20, therefore, appears to be Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery's attempt to codify the basic beliefs and tenets of the Church, as they had been commanded to do by Revelation. On Tuesday, 6th of April, 1830, following instructions received by Revelation, the church was organized at the home of Peter Whitmer Sr. in Fayette, New York. According to the laws of New York at that time, between three and nine individuals were required as members and responsible parties in the founding documents of a religious organization. The new church listed six initial members, Oliver Cowdery, Joseph Smith Jr., Hiram Smith, Peter Whitmer Jr., Samuel H. Smith, and David Whitmer. The name of the church was established in the Articles and Covenants. It changed several times during those early years. It was called the Church of Christ at its incorporation in 1830. Because there were many churches in New England that used that same name and to avoid confusion, on the 3rd of May, 1834, church leaders changed the name to the Church of the Latter-day Saints. On the 26th of April, 1838, the name of the church was changed by revelation to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Articles and Covenants served as the first priesthood handbook for the church, and it was read verbatim to members of the church at many early conferences. Between 1830 and 1835, it was revised and expanded several times to reflect additional revelations to Joseph Smith about the unfolding structure of the church. Let's start by examining the introduction. D&C 20, verse 1, quote, The rise of the Church of Christ in these last days, being 1,830 years since the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the flesh, it being regularly organized and established agreeable to the laws of our country by the will and commandments of God in the fourth month and on the sixth day of the month, which is called April, unquote. Many Latter-day Saints have inferred from this statement that it has given us an exact count of the years from the birth of Jesus to the restoration of the church. They've interpreted it to mean that Jesus was born on the 6th of April, 1 BC. On the other hand, several writers, including some modern apostles, have urged caution about interpreting this verse as a doctrinally binding declaration of the Lord's date of birth. It's fairly certain that 1,830 years is simply an elaborate way of referring to the year 1830 without intending to affirm that April 6th is Jesus's birthday. Verse five may contain an indirect reference to the first vision. D&C 20 verses five through eight, quote, after it was truly manifested unto this first elder that he had received a remission of his sins, he was entangled again in the vanities of the world but after repenting and humbling himself sincerely through faith, God ministered unto him by an holy angel whose countenance was as lightning and whose garments were pure and white above all other whiteness and gave unto him commandments which inspired him and gave him power from on high by the means which were before prepared to translate the Book of Mormon." Unquote. In two of his written accounts of the first vision, Joseph stated that the first thing the two divine personages who appeared in the grove told him was that his sins were forgiven. It was after that, he confessed, that he, quote, fell into transgressions and sinned in many things, unquote. He was praying for forgiveness for these sins on the night that the angel Moroni appeared to him, which is what verses six through eight are clearly, clearly referencing. If the beginning of verse five does allude to the first vision, it's the earliest written account that mentions this event. The Articles and Covenants of the Church also testify of the Book of Mormon. DNC 20, verse 9, quote, The Book of Mormon contains a record of a fallen people and the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles and to the Jews also. Unquote. 
what is the fullness of the gospel? Latter-day Saints generally define it as all that the Lord has revealed to us in the latter days up to the present time. It is evident, though, that the Book of Mormon does not contain many doctrines revealed in the last days, including the Word of Wisdom, the Three Degrees of Glory, Celestial Marriage, Vicarious Work for the Dead, and the Physical Nature of God the Father. The Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants, however, define the fullness of the gospel as the basic principles of faith, repentance, baptism, and the gift of the Holy Ghost. D&C 33 verses 10 through 12a, quote, Yea, open your mouths, and they shall be filled, saying, Repent, repent, and prepare ye the way of the Lord, and make his path straight. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yea, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for a remission of your sins. Yea, be baptized even by water. And then cometh the baptism of fire and of the Holy Ghost. Behold, verily, verily, I say unto you, this is my gospel." Unquote. Compare that passage with 3 Nephi 27, verses 20 through 21a. Quote, now, this is the commandment, Repent, all ye ends of the earth, and come unto me, and be baptized in my name, that ye may be sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost, that ye may stand spotless before me at the last day. Verily, verily, I say unto you, This is my gospel. Unquote. The Book of Mormon teaches the first principles and ordinances of the gospel with a plainness and clarity unequaled by any other book. It has therefore been declared by the Lord to contain the fullness of the gospel. This next passage, and others like it in the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants, can be confusing and challenging for Latter day Saints. DNC 20 verse 17, quote, By these things, that is to say, the revelations to Joseph, we know that there is a God in heaven who is infinite and eternal, from everlasting to everlasting, the same unchangeable God, the framer of heaven and earth and all things which are in them, unquote. Shortly before his death, Joseph Smith preached in Nauvoo, quote, we suppose that God was God from eternity. I will refute that idea, or I will do away or take away the veil, so you may see." Unquote. Joseph's latter statement may appear to contradict the ideas in section 20 that God is eternal from everlasting to everlasting and unchangeable. These statements on God's eternal nature, however, are descriptions of his character, not his person. There are two other passages of scripture that refer to God as unchangeable, and they both use this term in the context of God being consistent in how he interacts with human beings. Apostle George Q. Cannon taught, quote, the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is the cornerstone, it may be said, of our faith. It is upon this foundation we have built that he is an unchangeable God that he does not manifest his mind and his will in plainness and simplicity to one people and hide the same from a succeeding people who are equally faithful. But the great truth has been impressed upon us, the great truth that runs through all the writings of every man of God concerning whom we may have any account from the beginning down to the last revelation that has been given, that God is no respecter of persons, that he is today as he was yesterday and as he ever was, and that he will continue to be the same being as long as time endures or eternity continues." Unquote. Justification and sanctification are key doctrines of the New Testament, and they are found especially in the teachings of the Apostle Paul. They are repeated in the Articles and Covenants of the Church. D&C 20, verses 30 and 31. Quote, and we know that justification through the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is just and true. And we know also that sanctification through the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is just and true to all those who love and serve God with all their mights, minds, and strength." Unquote. 
What do the terms justification and sanctification mean? One Doctrine and Covenants commentary explains, quote, Justification is a judicial or legal term, and it means being acquitted or being declared innocent of all charges. Though all of us make mistakes in this life, we may, with repentance and baptism, and thereafter, as long as we stay in the gospel covenant, still be declared innocent of all sin, not because of our own perfect performance, which no one has, but because of Christ's perfect performance and his willingness to share it with us. We are justified or declared innocent before God by the sacrifice of Christ, and our acquittal or victory at the bar of justice is received only through reliance upon the merits of Christ. Sanctification is to be made holy, to become saints. When we have been rendered innocent by being justified through the grace of Christ by baptism, we are then worthy to receive the actual companionship of God in the person of the Holy Ghost. Receiving the Holy Ghost does not just make us clean, it also makes us holy, that is, sanctified. For this reason, all who have received the gift of the Holy Ghost are referred to collectively as saints, meaning holy ones. Through faith in Christ, repentance, baptism, and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, we are first rendered innocent, justified, and then we are made holy, sanctified, and may be called saints, the holy ones. Because we have received this blessing in the latter days, we are called Latter-day Saints, a collective term for those in our dispensation who have been justified and sanctified by the grace of Christ and who now work to endure faithfully to the end." Unquote. The Articles and Covenants of the Church explicitly rejects the teachings of Calvinism. D&C 20, verses 32 to 34, quote, But there is a possibility that man may fall from grace and depart from the living God. Therefore, let the church take heed and pray always, lest they fall into temptation, yea, and even let those who are sanctified take heed also. Calvinists are Protestant Christians who follow the teachings and interpretations of the 16th century reformer John Calvin. In addition to asserting that God determined from all eternity who those people who would be saved and those who would be damned, Calvinists believe in the perseverance of the saints, the teaching that a person who has been elected by God to be saved is permanently saved and cannot fall from grace. The New Testament is somewhat ambiguous on this issue, but the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants strongly affirm that remaining in the covenant requires our heart, might, mind, and strength, and that if we do not endure, we can fall from grace and lose our exaltation. The five requirements of those who are received by baptism into his church are set forth in verse 37. These persons must, quote, humble themselves before God and desire to be baptized and come forth with broken hearts and contrite spirits and witness before the church that they have truly repented of all their sins and are willing to take upon them the name of Jesus Christ, having a determination to serve him to the end and truly manifest by their works that they have received of the Spirit of Christ unto the remission of their sins." Unquote. Since the ordinance of the sacrament is a renewal of our baptismal covenants, do we approach each weekly sacrament service with these five commitments in mind? Do we have these desires and demonstrate these actions? Four priesthood offices are mentioned in section 20. Elders, which includes apostles, priests, teachers, and deacons. The duties of each office are hierarchical, with each having its own unique authority, plus the authority of the offices that follow it. Priesthood offices beyond those four are mentioned in verses 66 and 67, but these verses weren't part of the original Articles and Covenants of the Church. They were added at the publication of the first edition of the Doctrine and Covenants in 1835. There is no mention in this section of Aaronic, 
or Melchizedek priesthoods, nor any other division between the offices of the priesthood. The priesthood and its organization were revealed in stages. Joseph Smith did not understand, in the spring of 1830, the entirety of how the priesthood was to be ordered. He was given additional offices and their duties, line upon line, as the church grew and its needs developed. Even the understanding of separate and distinct Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthoods wasn't firmly established until 1835. The duties of the Aaronic priesthood, described in verses 46 to 59 of section 20, are noticeably different than the duties performed by young men in the church today. If you ask a member of the church what the duties of a teacher in the Aaronic priesthood are, he or she will probably reply to prepare the sacrament. Section 20 mentions nothing about preparing the sacrament, but it does describe the teacher's duties as follows. Dean C. 20, verses 53 to 56, quote, To watch over the church always, and be with and strengthen them, and see there is no iniquity in the church, neither hardness with each other, neither lying, backbiting, nor evil speaking, and see that the church meet together often, and also see that all the members do their duty, and he is to take the lead of meetings in the absence of the elder or priest." Unquote. It would be a stretch to claim that 14-year-old teachers in our day are actively seeking to make sure, let alone are primarily responsible for, that there is no lying, backbiting, nor evil speaking in the church, seeing that the church meet together often and conducting sacrament meetings. This is because the eligibility for and duties of the Aaronic priesthood developed over a period of nearly 100 years into the age-based programs we are familiar with today. The transformation of the Aaronic priesthood occurred in four stages. From 1829 to 1846, adult males were called to Aaronic priesthood offices as required by the needs of the church. As only mature individuals can carry out the responsibilities the Articles and Covenants assigned to priests and teachers, the earliest Aaronic priesthood holders were almost exclusively adult males. The first ordained priests were Joseph Smith Sr., 59 years old, Martin Harris, 47 years old, Hiram Smith, 30 years old, and Newell Knight, 30 years old. A few young men were ordained, Don Carlos Smith received the priesthood at age 14, and Erastus Snow was ordained a teacher at age 15, but such cases were rare. Adult priests and teachers presided in some branches where there was no organized stake of the church. Aaronic priesthood quorums were organized at the stake level. From 1847 to 1877, men who held the Melchizedek priesthood served as acting deacons, teachers, and priests, carrying out the duties of teaching the saints in their homes and administering the sacrament. In Utah, the ward became the main local unit of the church, with bishops as the chief local officers. Bishops called priests and teachers to carry out home visits to check on spiritual well-being, canvas for contributions, settle personal and family disputes, and help the needy. In the 1850s, Church leaders began to require men who were going to serve missions or be married in the temple to first be ordained to the Melchizedek priesthood. After that change, the number of eligible active adult males holding the Aaronic priesthood declined significantly. Most missionaries at that time were ordained as 70s, an office within the Melchizedek priesthood. Because of the shortage of Aaronic priesthood holders, the church's presiding bishopric directed that responsible high priests should be called as acting priests to administer the sacrament, or acting teachers to perform home visits. Because there was no systematic priesthood advancement for young men, the activity rate for young men in the church during this time was often quite low. Eliza R. Snow reported in 1878 that children, quote, often manifested but little regard for religious exercises, and young men generally sent on a mission were extremely ignorant of the first principles of the gospel." Unquote. In 1870, Salt Lake City's Ninth Ward reported that only 16% of its 181 families regularly attended sacrament meeting, and that 50% were perfectly indifferent. 
These circumstances prompted the creation of the Sunday School Primary and Young Men's and Young Women's Mutual Improvement Associations in the 1870s. From 1877 to 1908, every young man between 12 and 20 years old was expected to receive at least one Aaronic priesthood office, but Melchizedek priesthood holders continued to act as ward teachers and administer the sacrament. One month before Brigham Young's death in August 1877, the First Presidency issued a circular letter that reorganized the priesthood in the church. Two of the many changes they made included moving Aaronic priesthood quorums from stake to ward administration and encouraging local leaders to ordain young men to the Aaronic priesthood so they could gain experience and training. Within a year of these changes, hundreds of young men were ordained to the Aaronic priesthood, although the sacrament and in-home block teaching visits were still performed and supervised by Melchizedek priesthood holders who served as acting priests and teachers. It was at this time that deacons were given the duty of passing the sacrament to congregations under the interpretation that the priest's duty is to administer the sacrament means to bless it, while preparing and passing it are separate functions from administering it. Since 1908, Aaronic priesthood work has been designed for young men with offices linked to age groups, routine advancement by age, and specific duties like administering the sacrament and assisting with ward teaching. Two factors influence this reappraisal of Aaronic priesthood work. By the beginning of the 20th century, ordained missionaries were increasingly single men instead of married men. Between 1886 and 1890, only 18% of missionaries were single men. By 1895 to 1900, that number had increased to 51%. The main reason for this was economic. Utah was moving away from an agrarian economy more married men had salaried jobs and homes with mortgages, hindering them from leaving for full-time missionary service. The progressive movement was also prevalent in America at that time. It encouraged concern for the mental and moral health of youth, preventing juvenile delinquency and providing youth with recreational facilities and opportunities. In April 1908 General Conference, President Joseph F. Smith requested that boys be given, quote, something to do that will make them interested in the work of the Lord, and above all things, direct their energies in such a way that they will be helpful to the needy, helpful to the poor, helpful to themselves and to the church." Unquote. A priesthood committee responded by proposing reforms that came to be called the priesthood movement. One major recommendation was that boys move systematically through the offices of the Aaronic priesthood by age group. They suggested ordaining deacons at age 12, teachers at 15, priests at 18, and elders at 21. Another recommendation changed the name of block teaching to ward teaching, giving Melchizedek priesthood holders the assignment to carry it out and bishops the responsibility to supervise it. Eight years later, in 1916, deacons, teachers, and priests were given additional assignments to make them active and useful. Among other things, deacons were to collect fast offerings, carry messages for bishops, pass the sacrament, care for church cemeteries, and pump the organ and serve as ushers at church meetings. Teachers were to assist in ward teaching, assist with the sacrament, collect ward funds, be clerks in branches, and cut wood for the poor. Priests were to administer the sacrament, assist in ward teaching, baptize, be ward choristers, do missionary work in the ward, help the bishop with wayward boys, and haul gravel and make cement walks around meeting houses. In the 1940s, an elaborate achievement program was instituted in which young men earned awards and certificates based on activity, worthiness, and the priesthood assignments they filled. These changes took a generation to fully implement. It wasn't until the 1950s that all of them were fully realized and in working order. There was some resistance to these changes by local leaders who felt that young men were being advanced too quickly, especially if they weren't ready or active, and that giving young boys supervision over something as serious as the sacrament was inappropriate. In 1964, ward teaching was reorganized again as home teaching and placed under the supervision of elders quorum presidents 
and high priest group leaders. In 2018, home teaching was changed to ministering, high priest groups were eliminated, and elders quorum presidents became responsible for priesthood ministering efforts in wards and branches. These changes have made today's Aaronic priesthood holders responsible for duties that are not specifically outlined in the scriptures. For example, the Doctrine and Covenants says nothing about teachers and deacons preparing and passing the sacrament. Today's deacons pass the sacrament as part of their assigned responsibilities, but there is no scripture or written revelation that says passing the sacrament is an Aaronic priesthood assignment. That policy was instituted under inspiration, and it could be changed tomorrow under inspiration if the First Presidency decided to do so. In summary, the organization and responsibilities of the Aaronic Priesthood have developed over time by inspiration to meet the needs of the Lord's Church and its young men. Although the Aaronic Priesthood today doesn't function exactly like the requirements set forth in 1830 in the Articles and Covenants of the Church, it functions in the manner the Lord wants it to today. Tomorrow it could operate in a different manner if the Lord were to inspire his leaders to change it. We'll discuss the revealing and development of other priesthood offices, including bishop, seventy, and high priest, in future lessons. At the organization of the Church of Christ on the 6th of April, 1830, there was a great outpouring of the Spirit. Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery were sustained and ordained as the presiding elders of the Church. The sacrament of bread and wine was administered to those who attended the meeting, Every member was confirmed by the laying on of hands, and some of them prophesied. In front of the assembled group, Joseph dictated a revelation that primarily concerned his position relative to other members of the new church. DNC 21, verses 1 and 4 through 6. Quote, Behold, there shall be a record kept among you, and in it thou shalt be called a seer a translator, a prophet, an apostle of Jesus Christ, an elder of the church through the will of God the Father and the grace of your Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, meaning the church, thou shalt give heed unto all his words and commandments which he shall give unto you as he receiveth them, walking in all holiness before me. For his word ye shall receive, as if from mine own mouth, in all patience and faith, for by doing these things, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Yea, and the Lord God will disperse the powers of darkness from before you, and cause the heavens to shake for your good, and his name's glory. Unquote. By commanding, there shall be a record kept among you, the Lord charged the leaders of the new church to keep a record of its meetings, its revelations, its activities, and its history. What do these individual titles tell us about Joseph's role as the leader of the church? A seer is one who sees spiritual and material realities that are hidden to the world. In the Book of Mormon, this gift is connected with the use of interpreters or seer stones, and we learn that a gift which is greater can no man have. Joseph Smith was not a translator in the typical sense. Rather, he translated using the gift of seership. Joseph translated the Book of Mormon and revealed many other ancient things that he called translations, including his revision of the Bible, the Book of Abraham, and a lost parchment of John. Prophecy is a gift of the Spirit that is available to all members of the Lord's Church. Joseph Smith and his successors have been called the prophet, a term used to refer to the head of the church, whose calling it is to reveal the mind and will of the Lord and to direct the affairs of the church. People commonly think of a prophet as someone who foretells the future, but that is only part of a prophet's calling. An apostle is a special witness of the name of Christ in all the world. Apostles hold the keys of the priesthood and preside over the church. In addition to being an office within the Melchizedek priesthood, the term elder refers to general authorities of the Lord's Church. The Revelation now canonized as section 22, 
was revealed on the 16th of April, 1830, 10 days after the church was organized. Early apostle Orson Pratt provided the context for this revelation in an address he gave in 1873. Quote, in the early days of this church, there were certain persons belonging to the Baptist denomination, very moral, and no doubt as good people as you could find anywhere, who came saying they believed in the Book of Mormon and that they had been baptized into the Baptist church and they wished to come into our church. The Prophet Joseph had not at that time particularly inquired in relation to this matter, but he did inquire and received a revelation from the Lord something like this, that although a man had been baptized a hundred times under these old institutions, it would avail him nothing. These Baptists had to be rebaptized. There was no other way to get into this church. There is not a person now in full fellowship with this people, but what has come in by baptism, whether he formerly belonged to the Baptist or any other church." Unquote. This revelation introduced a theological term that's significant to the Restoration. DNC 22 verse 1. Quote, Behold, I say unto you, that all old covenants have I caused to be done away in this thing, and this is a new and an everlasting covenant, even that which is from the beginning. Unquote. What is a new and everlasting covenant? The Encyclopedia of Mormonism explains, quote, The new and everlasting covenant is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The sum of all gospel covenants that God makes with mankind is called the New and Everlasting Covenant, and consists of several individual covenants, each of which is called a New and an Everlasting Covenant. It is new when given to a person or a people for the first time, and everlasting because the gospel of Jesus Christ and the plan of salvation existed before the world was formed and will exist forever." Unquote. This difference is made explicit in section 132, the Lord's revelation on eternal marriage. Eternal marriage is a new and an everlasting covenant. It is one component of a fullness which constitutes the new and everlasting covenant. In section 22, verse 1, this thing refers to baptism, which is a new and everlasting covenant, one element of a larger covenant called the new and everlasting covenant. In the latter half of April 1830, five brethren, Oliver Cowdery, Hiram Smith, Samuel H. Smith, Joseph Smith Sr., and Joseph Knight Sr., came to Joseph Smith Jr., being anxious to know of the Lord what might be their respective duties in relation to this work. Joseph inquired of the Lord and received a brief revelation for each of them. These revelations were initially published individually. They were combined into a single section for the 1835 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants. In the current edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, this is section 23. Note the Lord's instructions to Hiram Smith in verse 3, quote, Thy heart is opened, and thy tongue loosed, and thy calling is to exhortation, and to strengthen the church continually, unquote. Contrast this with the Lord's instructions to Hiram given 11 months earlier in section 11, verse 21, quote, Seek not to declare my word, but first seek to obtain my word, and then shall your tongue be loosed, unquote. Hiram was baptized in June 1829, and he was one of the eight witnesses of the Book of Mormon. He was also among the six original members of the church when it was organized on the 6th of April, 1830. In this revelation, Hiram was called to exhortation, preaching aimed at influencing behavior, and strengthening the church, which he did for the remainder of his life. Shortly after this revelation, Hiram was ordained as a priest. The church held its first conference on the 9th of June, 1830 in Fayette, New York. After the conference, Joseph returned to his home in Harmony, Pennsylvania, he hadn't been there in nearly a year. Shortly after coming home, Joseph took his wife, Emma, Oliver Cowdery, and brothers, John and David Whitmer, to visit the Knight family in Colesville, New York. 
Some residents of Colesville, who had been converted to the restored gospel, were baptized while Joseph was there. During this visit, Joseph was arrested and tried twice on the charge of being a disorderly person. After being acquitted in both cases, he returned to Harmony. A few days later, he returned to Colesville with Oliver Cowdery, but they were forced to flee all night from Moab. While he was in Harmony during the summer of 1830, Joseph received the vision of Moses that is now the first chapter of the Book of Moses in the Pearl of Great Price, along with four revelations that are now canonized as sections 24 through 27. In the first of those revelations, section 24, Joseph was commanded to continue in the work of confirming those who had been baptized, dictating revelations, and teaching from the scriptures. In this revelation, the Lord simultaneously encouraged chastened and gave directions to Joseph. DNC 24 verse 1, quote, Behold, thou wast called and chosen to write the Book of Mormon, and to my ministry, and I have lifted thee up out of thine afflictions, and have counseled thee, that thou hast been delivered from all thine enemies, and thou hast been delivered from the powers of Satan and from darkness." Unquote. That final statement about being delivered from human enemies and from the powers of Satan and from darkness may have some connection to Joseph's mention in September 1842 about hearing the voice of Michael on the banks of the Susquehanna River detecting the devil when he appeared as an angel of light. That's DNC 128 verse 20. DNC 24 verse 8, quote, be patient in afflictions, for thou shalt have many, but endure them, for lo, I am with thee, even unto the end of thy days." Unquote. This council came after Joseph had experienced the first organized opposition to the restored church since it had been established. Joseph was told that this was just the beginning of the afflictions he would be called to endure, and that he should be patient as he experienced more of them. Righteousness and faithful service do not guarantee freedom from difficulties or trials. In these early days of the Restoration, the Lord was already preparing Joseph for the continual opposition he and his followers would face. DNC 24 verse 15, quote, And in whatsoever place ye shall enter, and they receive you not in my name, ye shall leave a cursing instead of a blessing, by casting off the dust of your feet against them as a testimony and cleansing your feet by the wayside." Unquote. The practice of dusting one's feet appears in the New Testament and the Doctrine and Covenants. It is a symbolic witness or testimony that the people in a certain place who have rejected the gospel message are responsible for the consequences of their rejection. Apostle James E. Talmadge wrote, quote, to ceremonially shake the dust from one's feet as a testimony against another was understood by the Jews to symbolize a cessation of fellowship and a renunciation of all responsibility for consequences that might follow. It became an ordinance of accusation and testimony by the Lord's instructions to his apostles. In the current dispensation, the Lord has similarly directed his authorized servants to so testify against those who willfully and maliciously oppose the truth when authoritatively presented. The responsibility of testifying before the Lord by this accusing symbol is so great that the means may be employed only under unusual and extreme conditions as the Spirit of the Lord may direct." Unquote. About this same time, Joseph received another revelation which revealed an important principle concerning the administration of the church. DNC 26, verse 2, quote, And all things shall be done by common consent in the church, by much prayer and faith, for all things you shall receive by faith. Amen. Unquote. What is common consent? The Encyclopedia of Mormonism explains, quote, Common consent is a fundamental principle of decision-making at all levels in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 
In selecting new officers and making administrative decisions, church leaders are instructed to seek the will of God. Once the Lord makes his will known and a decision is reached, the matter is brought before the appropriate quorum or body of church members who are asked to sustain or oppose the action." Unquote. What is the purpose of common consent? One Doctrine and Covenants commentary explains, quote, One purpose for the practice of taking a sustaining vote is to protect the members against appointments made by church leaders who may not be aware of pertinent facts concerning the individuals proposed. Sustaining also places the membership of the church, collectively, in a position of governance and gives them a veto power when their voice is combined. No single individual can stop a proposed action without accurate information that raises serious questions or of worthiness, but all objections will be heard and considered for merit. Should a majority of the saints refuse to sustain a name or a proposed action, it must be withdrawn. The principle of common consent does not, however, create a democracy, for the members do not nominate individuals or propose actions. These are entirely prerogatives of priesthood leadership, but the church must collectively agree to all that binds them and to all who preside over them. This is a basic law of heaven." Unquote. Elder Joseph Fielding Smith taught, quote, the priesthood selects under the inspiration of our Father in heaven, and then it is the duty of the Latter-day Saints, as they are assembled in conference or other capacity, by the uplifted hand, to sustain or reject. And I take it that no man has the right to raise his hand in opposition, or with contrary vote, unless he has a reason for doing so, that would be valid if presented before those who stand at the head. In other words, I have no right to raise my hand in opposition to a man who is appointed to any position in this church simply because I may not like him, or because of some personal disagreement or feeling that I may have, but only on the grounds that he is guilty of wrongdoing, of transgression of the laws of the church, which would disqualify him for the position which he is called to hold." Unquote. That concludes this lesson. If you enjoyed it, please click the thumbs up button and leave a comment below. Please subscribe if you'd like to be notified when new lessons are posted to this channel and visit www.huarc.org to download these notes and this slideshow. In our next lesson, we'll discuss Emma Hale Smith and her children, the emblems of the sacrament and how the gift of revelation operates in the church. The reading is Doctrine and Covenants, sections 25 and 27 through 28. See you next week.